If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I am Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is prime time where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. Rishi Sunak vows to pass unprecedented emergency laws and ignore the European courts to put migrants on planes to Rwanda by the spring after the Supreme Court tore apart his current plan. But can the Prime Minister really pull it all off in time? And has he done enough to see off Suella Braverman's right-wing Tory rebellion? And right now, Labour MPs are voting in the Commons on whether to call for a ceasefire in Gaza, with Sakir Starmer facing the prospect of having to sack any members of his front bench who dare to defy him. Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel, look at other stories making headlines today with social and political commentator Joanna Jarju and associate editor of The Telegraph, Ben Wright. This is Primetime. Well, before we get to our top story, as mentioned, voting is underway currently in the House of Commons as Keir Starmer faces a rebellion over his stance on the Gaza ceasefire, which could leave him with no option but to sack members of his top team. One front bencher has already resigned just in the last few minutes. How many more could there be by the end of the night? We'll be following this closely and bring you the latest pictures and details as soon as we have them. Now, though, separately, still staying in Westminster, though, the merry-go-round continues to go around. Rishi Sunak is about to attempt political alchemy with his pledge tonight to go further than any other government in his bid to stop the boats. His promise to pass emergency laws and a new treaty letting the UK ignore any attempt at home or abroad to stop migrant flights to Rwanda. This will enable Parliament to confirm that with our new treaty, Rwanda is safe. It will ensure that people cannot further delay flights by bringing systemic challenges in our domestic courts and stop our policy being repeatedly blocked. I told Parliament earlier today that I'm prepared to change our laws and revisit those international relationships to remove the obstacles in our way. So let me tell everybody now, I will not allow a foreign court to block these flights. Well, in part, it is a response to this morning's Supreme Court verdict, smacking down the current scheme as unlawful. But it is also, of course, a challenge to his biggest critics. Among them, the ex-Home Secretary Suella Bravman, who demanded something quite similar, actually, on social media about 30 minutes before Prime Minister Sunak spoke. Her former colleagues making little secret about how they saw her exit and her accusations of betrayal a little earlier today. I will inform the House we are not going to put forward proposals simply to manufacture un un an unnecessary row for political gain. <laughs> but immigration isn't the only issue for all that the small boats do keep landing, more than 600 on a single day last week. After 13 years in power, the government has a delivery problem and the opposition had no problem pointing it out after this morning's ruling. He promised that he would stop the boats this year, yeah. this year. Today is the 15th of November. He's wasted all of his time on a gimmick, and now he's absolutely nowhere. Will he level with the British public and finally admit he's failed to deliver on his promise? Well, this is Rishi Sunak's big throw of the dice. It's Rwanda or bust at this point with a deadline of spring next year. But he has got to get this new plan of his through Parliament whilst being fought tooth and nail by the opposition. And then he's got to face down any legal challenges in the courts. What he's got to hope as well is that after 13 years of Conservative promises and with the polls as pretty much as against him as they get, 
that the voters are still listening to him. We're here for more on these unprecedented steps to talk them through the Spectator's political correspondent James Heal and immigration lawyer Harjup Singh Bangal. Thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, James, another busy day for you guys in Westminster. I mean, did you see this coming at all, Sunak's speech, in terms of really doubling down? Well, I mean, I think that he's made it a key pledge for himself. It's mm -hmm. something that a lot of Red Wall Tory MPs tell me that they get a lot of correspondence about in their inboxes every day. And having, of course, achieved that first of his pledges today to halve inflation by the end of 2023, uh, there was obviously going to be the big focus on stopping the small boats crisis. Uh, but I do think I was a little bit surprised when he came out later this afternoon because there were some MPs earlier today talking about perhaps, you know, was there a way, different way to do this? You didn't have to carry on with the Rwanda scheme. Of course, it was Boris Johnson's flagship pledge. He could perhaps have done a different uh, deal. But I think coming out today, it's one of those press conferences where it's left us with more questions than answers because he's talking, first of all, about this emergency legislation. Well, it's just normal legislation that's going to go through this process. We need to see the devil in the detail in order to try and work out what exactly it's going to mean. But I have to say, on the face of it, there's a lot of confused MPs walking around Parliament right now. <laughs> I've just been speaking to some of them. And they're going to be waiting and see over the coming days and weeks to see what the government's response is going to be. But at the moment, it's very bolshy and it's a very aggressive one. But uh, I have to see, uh, I'm so far not sure that it's going to work. We'll come to the devil in the detail shortly with Harjat, but just uh, just a moment on that sort of the positionings within the party and within yeah. Sunak's government at the moment. You know, he only appointed David Cameron. I'm starting to lose track. Was it yesterday <laughs> as foreign secretary after making him appear? And, you know, what type of consensus would Sunak have sought amongst his sort of lead generals to do this, if at all? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, the key issue here is the European Convention on Human Rights. And mm. I think that while Suella Braverman, as a kind of force in her own right, only has about sort of 30 supporters in the party, ECHR membership is something that I think more of the centre-right could get behind in terms of making that an issue going into the next election. So I think that listening to James Cleverly in the House of Commons earlier today, I thought initially that it was going to be much more uh, cautious and sceptical of the idea of pulling out the ECHR. As we saw later from that sort of 445 press conference with the Prime Minister, it actually seems to be much more on the table. Whether or not it's just a threat, a mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, sort of Northern Ireland Protocol style threat to hang over the Strasbourg courts remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. But the rhetoric is certainly much more aggressive than I was anticipating earlier today. Now, I'm glad you brought up Northern Ireland because it's something that's been highlighted um, hard up as being key within the ECHR or the Convention on Human Rights is something people often overlook. And there's going to be this big debate about whether how much we should be complying with Strasbourg as well. I mean, what type of precedent is there for basically trying to not override the ECHR or Strasbourg, but do things your own way? Well, governments ignore courts quite frequently, I think you'll find. And uh, it, however, it's all about what the political comeback on it is, how you want to be seen amongst the political spectre, how much uh, your relations are. And obviously, you've got things like the Good Friday Agreement, our EU trade agreement, the TCA. Um, do you want to jeopardise all of that to send 500 people to Rwanda, out of which 200 you might have to take back as part of a return agreement, which you've signed? Essentially, this is it. I mean, is, is this just a sort of uh, insistence of, I want to get this flight off even if it's one just because I said it will or are we going to deport send back or send to around 50,000 people a year it's not possible we only have 500 places what are we going to do with for the 49,500 that come throughout the rest of the year mm. I mean you mentioned today 600 people come a day came a day so that's one day's people sent to Rwanda. Okay, what about the other six days? And we've got 52 weeks in a year. So it's just something that's not practical. It's not a practical solution. It's almost like saying we're going to deter drug dealing, drug dealers, by locking up all the drug users, uh, locking up some drug, and hope that drug dealers will stop. People smugglers will not stop because 500 people have been sent to Rwanda. They're, they're the key, and they're the key that people that need to be stopped. But what we're hearing is uh, smashing the gangs. They tried that. It didn't work. So in terms of the alternatives, and Sunak really didn't lead, lay out any today other than basically we're going to do this our own way. We've got this treaty. And we're going to get that plane to Rwanda by spring. But in terms of other alternatives that could be on the table for dealing with migration then, what would you suggest? Um, first of all, smash the gangs. I mean, mm. the, we know the gangs have been operating for the best part of 20 years. We all know, even children know, they operate from Calais and they end up on the, the Kent coast. Everyone knows the same route. It's the same route. It's almost like saying that there's a bus driver who drives from A to B for the past 20 years on the same bus. And when we ask the government, can you identify the bus driver? Oh, no, he's too smart for us, Governor. He's, a, he's 20 steps ahead of us. So we can't smash these gangs 
you've got to open up some sort of safe route, perhaps with cooperation with the French in Calais, where people can apply, like the Ukrainians can apply in that sort of scheme. Also, processing times. It's taking two years to decide a claim. In the year 2001 and 2002, there was, there was a fast-track system where 15 days your claim was done and dusted. They even had a court in a detention centre in Harmonsworth near Heathrow that if you decided to appeal, they'd be listed and the week after. So on a 20th day, you could potentially be sent back. Not deciding claims for two years, and it's not just one case, it's a backlog of over 150,000. Um, not allowing people to work for the first year, therefore having to house them in hotels. Mm. This is not good. The fact is that the Home Office is not fit for purpose. Every year, a Home Affairs Select Committee tells us this machinery is not fit for purpose. Now, what you've got with broken machinery and a broken factory, you're never going to have a good product. Now, James, listening in on that, um, do you think the sort of roll of the dice from Sunat then, just getting a plane to Rwanda, do you think that will improve his polling, just people seeing a plane in the sky by spring? Well, I mean, the argument put forward is that it's a deterrent effect, of course, and I think perhaps, you know, there could be something for a psychological point in terms of a political point. I think, you know, Labour have obviously made a huge amount of it opposition in terms of practical grounds because Labour know they have an issue in terms of on migration and that's something they've been traditionally attacked over. They therefore want to oppose it on pragmatic grounds. At the moment, I mean, that's an argument that seems to be certainly winning, judging by today's decision. I, I think it's a very difficult one in the sense that he's constantly amped this up, ramped it up. I do wonder, perhaps, we're getting to a point where actually he's run out of room for manoeuvre in that none of the measures seem to go far enough as the some of the Tory right would like and then you're at danger and also getting into complicated legal expensive fights which detract from those things which you are making achievements on such as when you have a deal with Albania for instance or other priorities as well like halving inflation so the mm -hmm. question is is this going to be something that's politically popular po politically viable there are some within the party who would like him to kind of rerun the 2019 playbook which was get Brexit done as made the European issue but that was a very different context that being something that had been bedeviling the political class for three years. I think this issue has far less electoral salience. And we saw that with the polling on the ECHR membership. It is a lot less... Uh, pulling out the ECHR is a lot less popular than leaving the EU or getting Brexit done in 2019 was. And I think the Conservatives need to remember that mm. when making the judgments about politics about priorities, which ones you want to make you're focusing on. And uh, there's a danger they're going to get bogged down in this. Just on the bogged down point, I just want to ask Harjab, uh, you know, use your legal brain while we have you. In terms of this treaty idea Sunak has got about basically uh, reforming the approach to Rwanda or convincing everyone that Rwanda is safe enough to legally send migrants there, what will that legal process look like and will he get it done in time while he's still in power? It could take ages, it could take years. I mean, it could take two or three years to convince anybody that Rwanda is safe. I don't I don't think he's got that much time and to enact all of that and before a general election which we at the latest will be November I don't think that's going to be possible so he might say the right words and he's playing the right game but in effect I mean where what are you going to do it's not only EU legislation there's three acts in the UK and the 1993 act the nationality and asylum act of 2002 which was quoted today and the 2004 act are we going to reform all of them and ignore all of them are we going to repeal them are we, the ECHR are we going to ignore Strasbourg I mean how, how are we going to play it and of course an act would have to go through parliament that's both Houses of Parliament, which means the House of Lords, and you, they've got a veto, any legislation of up to a year. You've only got 14 months for the next election. I am very, very interested to see how they choose to try and square the circle in the coming weeks. We are all interested, and he said he didn't want the merry-go-round to continue. Uh, so, anyway, uh, Harjap Singh Bangal, James Hill in the studio. Thank you both for an interesting discussion there to start the show. Well, the nuclear option for the Prime Minister remains pulling out of the European Court of Hu Convention of Human Rights altogether, as we were just discussing there. One man who knows a fair amount about the law as well around this is former Justice Secretary David Gork. We spoke to him before the Prime Minister's announcement this afternoon, discussing the chances for the Conservatives at the next election and the return of his old boss, David Cameron. But we began on the problems as Mr Gork sees them with leaving the ECHR. There's a big issue to do with Northern Ireland if we were to leave the ECHR. Uh, the ECHR is, a, is an important part of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, what happens if the UK goes, you know, departs from the ECHR? What happens to the Good Friday Agreement? There are knock-on effects for Northern Ireland that could be very, very complicated. And we don't want to be in the position, I would have thought, once again, of leaving a, an international institution only to find that there's a massive problem with Northern Ireland that people hadn't really thought about when they made the initial decision. So, you know, again, I think we've got to be very, very uh, cautious about going down that route. 
Sounds, uh, yeah, like somewhat familiar territory, as you said there. Now, uh, whilst we stay with the topic of law, you're the former Justice Secretary. It was one of the roles you held in government when you were in government. I want to ask your opinion on the words that we got out of the Conservative Deputy Party Chairman, Lee Anderson, today, saying that basically we should ignore the law and uh, send people on planes to Rwanda anyway. Well, the generous response to it is to say that he's just letting off steam and speaking without thinking. I think there's a broader point here. The rule of law has to be fundamental to what we're about as a country. Um, it is a large part of our history. It is how our system of government has operated for centuries. Governments don't just simply ignore the law. Um, governments have to uphold the law. And if that is a serious position, if that is something that he wants to sort of maintain, it, it's not a position that the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party should hold. Well, if we look at precedent of the last few days, Sunak has acted on repercussions for words. He sacked Home Secretary Suella Bravman. She'd made those comments in the Times newspaper about policing during the marches and about homeless people in the last few days. She called her own language a bit careless or something like to that effect in her letter. In terms of the way the party is going then, bringing Cameron back in and, and booting uh, Bravman out, do you think it's the right decision? Yes, I do. I think uh, both in uh, Suella Bravman leaving the cabinet and David Cameron joining the cabinet, I think that's a pretty substantial upgrade in the quality of the cabinet. Um, the Conservative Party has got to make a decision. Does it want to be a proper sensible traditional party of the centre-right that believes in institutions, that believes in the rule of law, uh, tries to solve problems in government, not create them, or does it want to be a populist party? And too often in recent years, the Conservative Party has gone in the direction of being populist. Uh, I think in this week, uh, we have seen Rishi Sunak uh, turn his back on that. I hope that is a big strategic decision he's made, and this isn't just a sort of one-off. And I hope he maintains that position. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a stronger cabinet this week than we had last week. Well, looking at the polling, though, moving away from that populism, Conservatives declining in popularity. So do you think uh, the next election is winnable at this point? It's going to be a huge struggle for the Conservatives to win the next election. Uh, I think with everything that has gone on over the last seven years, winning back those centrist voters isn't going to be straightforward or easy. It's not going to be done with a couple of cabinet changes. It needs to be sustained. Um, but you've also got a situation where the Conservatives have been in office for a long time. The economy is, although good news with inflation today, the economy is not in the best of shapes. Uh, and all of that makes it very, very challenging. Nonetheless, I hope that if we put a year away from a general election, if the Conservatives can govern sensibly, uh, govern maturely, uh, appeal to the centre ground of British politics, then there's no reason to believe that they can't recover some ground. But they're a long way behind at the moment. Uh, and the sooner they get on with uh, moving in the right direction, the better. David Gork, former Justice Secretary, thank you. Thank you. Well, Sunak's press conference this afternoon, as we mentioned at the top of the show, was barely half an hour after the now ex-Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, went on social media and demanded similar emergency legislation on this Rwanda plan. Among her allies is the Boris Johnson backing Conservative Democratic organisation. We're joined now by the CDO's chairman and former Conservative MEP, David Campbell Bannerman. David, thank you. Um, and look, I don't want to speak uh, on behalf of you, but you would represent the side of the party that would presumably welcome Sunak's comments this afternoon. Well, yes, I, I do. I think it's a, it's a move in the right direction. I think a lot of questions about how fast it can be delivered, uh, where if it can be delivered, you know, got through Parliament. The House of Lords can be very obstructive, for example, and this kind of thing. Um, but yes, it's going the right direction. I, I think uh, the it's interesting your debate there just there. Um, you know, the focus now is on the ECHR and and actually the Human Rights Act. I'd like to see that got rid of. It's back to what Dominic Rabb was working on. Uh, he wanted to get rid of Human Rights Act. He wanted a Bill of Rights. Um, and it's a real shame that all got binned by Sunak when he came in and Rabb, of course, had to go. Uh, 
Um, and I think we need to go back to that kind of approach. Um, you know, it was Labour's Human Rights Act, Tony Blair's Human Rights Act, that requires our courts to take into account uh, ECHR judgments. And as a German justice said to me in Strasbourg, she said, I understand it's all about who has the last word. I think that's what it's about. Look, on the Human Rights Act and ECHR uh, staff, I'm interested to know if you think you've got the backing um, of voters on that. When I was speaking to David Gork earlier, the former Justice Secretary, he was talking about the fact that only Russia and Belarus have decided to sort of pull out of the ECHR or not comply with it. And if many voters were aware of that fact, would they want the United Kingdom to do the same? Well, the European Convention of Human Rights, the actual original documents written by British lawyers mainly to give the rest of Europe the kind of freedoms and rights that we uh, have traditionally, going back to Magna Carta, et cetera. So that's not a bad document. The way it's interpreted, uh, interpreted by, well, there used to be a Russian justice, you know, for example, uh, judging some of these cases. Um, that is the real worry. I think, you know, it's that court overruling, frankly, our Supreme Court, which is meant to be supreme. So even though we've had this judgment today from the Supreme Court, it's not actually supreme when the European Court of Human Rights is kind of above it. So I, I don't think that's a healthy position. So that is very relevant, yes. What do you make then of the idea that not only are we battling, some people in this country are battling with European courts, but also internally with British courts at the moment? As you mentioned there, the Supreme Court, it sounds even like the current government aren't really, I mean, they're accepting the rule of the law, but they want to find creative ways around it. Yes, as I say, it's the Human Rights Act. We have to get rid of it. It, it, it. I think even Tony Blair admitted it hasn't worked as as they planned. And as I say, it that requires our courts to look at it like Article Eight. I mean, a lot of these challenges over the boats, uh, boat people coming in, uh, uh, revolve around the fact that our courts have to take into account all these sorts of human rights measures under those articles. Uh, the Human Rights Act actually is more important than leaving the uh, convention, though, frankly, um, you know, that may well come. And I think we'll, we may well see that in the manifesto. But I have to say, Sunak has done quite a move today away from the position um, that that was, you know, much softer on the option of leaving the ECHR. And I think that's because of what Suella has done and good for her for actually, you know, making the case and for being very firm on uh, sorting this out. In addition to the topic of migrants, I mean, do you care about preserving human rights laws in this country? And if so, then uh, what would you suggest other than the Human Rights Act? Well, we have these rights anyway. As I say, a lot of them are historical. Um, you know, we, we looked after a lot of refugees during the war, if you remember, you know, a lot of Jewish refugees. There's a great sort of statue at Liverpool Street Station of children we, we brought in. So it's not like uh, the Human Rights Act invented our human rights. They go right back hundreds of years. Um, and I don't think it's actually very helpful. Um, you know, they've actually been reinterpreted, those rights, in the wrong way. Uh, I know it's a complex area. I mean, there's the there's the EU has the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. I mean, it's a, it's a rights fest. And uh, Suella actually did a fantastic speech on the Refugee Convention, which lies behind us. We're not actually talking with the boat people. They are economic migrants, better life, which you can understand, but they're not like asylum seekers, many of them. And I, I think that's what's gone horribly wrong, you know. And I think uh, there is a real difficulty here that if we can't actually deal with the numbers, then the, the, the public are getting very, very angry at this. Uh, and we could it could lead to trouble. Well, let's just talk then a moment about uh, the public anger as you see it, because the polling for the Conservative Party in a steady state of decline at the moment, Labour pulling well ahead. Um, do you think this, uh, I'm not going to call it an about turn today from Sunak, but this kind of confirmation of what he wants to do when it comes to the boats issue, do you think it's going to be enough to get him through to win the election for the Conservatives next year? Well, I think Sunak is in deep trouble, actually. I mean, you, you saw the letter yesterday from Suella, which is devastating. And actually, of course, her point is he doesn't actually deliver on his pledges. You know, she did this deal with him and she'll release more on that. And 
Therefore, there are questions over what is announced today, I'm afraid. There are letters going in. I mean, it's a secretive process. Not everyone announces it. I think six have been announced. You need 53. There could be a leadership challenge. And I think that is what's shaken the government into action today. They didn't quite expect this. They they have obviously planned for the, this downside. Um, and we're seeing the reaction of that um, uh, today, which is good. But the point is, you know, I think it's a very serious situation for Sunak, and he could well face the challenge. David Campbell Bannerman, chair of the Conservative Democratic Organization. Thank you. Thank you. Well, bringing you this breaking news now, Labour's motion for humanitarian pauses in Israel, uh, in the Israel-Hamas conflict, has been defeated so far. MPs have voted in favour, 183 votes, and against 290 votes. Now they are voting on the SNP motion, calling for a complete ceasefire in the conflict. Then we will know the size of the rebellion Sakir Starmer faces. So on that first vote on the humanitarian pauses, it has been a defeat, but the secondary motion on a ceasefire put forward by the SNPs, we await to find out. And of course, that will be critical for the Labour Party. We'll keep you abreast of the details as they come through next year at prime time. We will be live in Westminster to bring you those details. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Now, it has been a day of high drama in Westminster, not just for the party in charge and those Rwanda plans, 
But Labour, the opposition, also facing the prospect of multiple resignations from the front bench over leader Sakir Starmer's stance on a Gaza ceasefire. Now, voting has been underway for the last few minutes, with Labour's call for humanitarian pauses defeated by more than 100 votes in just the last five minutes. Now, some rebels are expected to have backed the SNP's motion, calling for an immediate ceasefire in fighting. And the stakes could not be higher. Labour ordering its MPs to abstain on the SNP's motion, meaning its newly shuffled front bench is shrinking with each rebel. Shadow ministers Yasmin Qureshi and Afzal Khan are among those stepping down, with Shadow Devolution Minister Paul Labarca joining them just minutes ago. We'll get an idea of how big all this is pretty soon, amid speculation on just how many of the shadow front bench will be left by this evening's end. Joining me live from Central Lobby is Deputy London Playbook Editor for Politico, Dan Loom. Look, thanks for joining us. What have you seen in just the last half hour or so? Well, everything's still going on at the moment. You might be able to hear the division bells are ringing around me, but it looks like uh, we've had probably the biggest rebellion uh, of Keir Starmer's leadership um, on the Labour benches so far. Uh, I haven't had the numbers verified yet. It's literally they voted in the last few minutes on this SNP call for a full ceasefire. But it looks like uh, we have sort of somewhere in the region of 50 rebels. Uh, which is more than we think there has ever been against Keir Starmer's leadership um, in a Commons vote like this. Um, the Labour amendment earlier was about steps towards a ceasefire in the long run, but didn't actually use the C word, if you like. This was an SNP amendment for a full and immediate ceasefire, and the Labour leadership said that, you know, it's a political game, it won't help, it's trying to cause rifts in the Labour Party. But the strength of feeling on the back benches and some of the front benches about this is just so strong that people felt that they couldn't vote any other way. It's fascinating to watch that. And just to remind our viewers that Keir Starmer has kept a very firm stance on this from a start. The C word, as you mentioned there, not backing that. Whereas he, you know, the longer humanitarian pauses, that motion was defeated earlier on about 20 minutes ago. And then this rebellion amongst the front benches that we're talking about here, these are certain members of the Labour Party that have been talking about the need for a ceasefire in Gaza, the cost, the humanitarian cost that we're seeing, the thousands of deaths amongst Palestinian citizens. And not only that, but there are said to be, you know, potentially hundreds, if not thousands of people outside the palaces of Westminster this evening. Does it feel like there's a lot of pressure there at the moment? There's a huge amount of pressure on Labour MPs. Uh, within their communities, uh, there are people who are speaking out, who are flooding their email inboxes, who are protesting outside their um, offices, calling for a full ceasefire and for a stronger line from them, if you like. Some MPs have done that, and some have sort of held the party line and gone for the more nuanced Labour amendment. Now, the basic argument here is one of almost sort of head versus heart, as some MPs have put it. So the heart argument is there are people dying in their thousands in Gaza and that something has to be done about it. The head argument, which is being advanced by sort of allies of Keir Starmer, is that it won't make much difference. MPs here in the Palace of Westminster kind of asking uh, Israel and Hamas to do something when even the implorations of uh, US President Joe Biden are not always listened to. Mm. Um, there's also the element that Keir Starmer is sort of looking at this through the lens of what would he do if he was prime minister right now? And a shadow cabinet minister put it to me earlier that if you're in government, you don't start passing motions in parliament, in their words, to sort of put political pressure on the diplomatic service like that. It's just not how it works. So there's a very sort of divided um, stance on the issue here where some are saying we just must show that we want to do more and some are saying no, we must show that actually uh, we take a different view of things because we could be the government. Uh, look, Dan, we spoke about those numbers on this motion calling for the Israel-Hamas ceasefire that the SNP tabled, uh, put forward. We've got those numbers now. The results were in favour of a ceasefire was 125 votes and against was 293 votes. So a large defeat there for that motion, not only for the longer humanitarian pauses, but for the ceasefire as well. And, you know, you mentioned uh, Joe Biden there, the US president, someone they're saying that the complexity of approach 
researching this issue in the House of Commons is that leaders, uh, potentially Sir Keir Starmer himself, feel that they cannot call for a ceasefire until they're in alliance with or in lockstep with the US on such an issue. That is right. Uh, that is the Labour Party's approach and that is the government's approach. That um, it, not officially, but sort of unofficially, they tack very close to what the White House is doing because it's all about showing that the West is united and has a kind of clear line on this rather than Britain kind of pinging out at an angle and saying this is what we think. Um, just to go back to those numbers that you mentioned, I'm sorry to have them broken to me on air. Um, I think it's, the important thing is not whether the amendment was defeated. Uh, that was always going to happen. The important thing is that 125 number, I believe you said it was, because that shows that it was an SNP amendment. They have 30-odd MPs. That leaves nearly 100 MPs from other parties, which are going to be mostly Labour, uh, who have been supporting this. So the full numbers will probably come out in the next 10 or 20 minutes. Uh, but that does point towards, unless I'm missing something enormous, uh, quite a big Labour rebellion. Dan Bloom, it's been really useful having you there speaking to us from the Commons this evening. We'll let you get back to it now. Apologies for breaking that to you on air. You found it out via us. Uh, and we'll just fill in our viewers now on the exact numbers once again from those two votes on the fighting in Gaza. Labour's call for extended humanitarian pauses was defeated by 290 votes to 183. And the SNP's amendment we were just talking about there, demanding a ceasefire, was defeated once again by 293 votes to 125 who claims the number of Labour rebels could reach as high as almost 60 of their 198 MPs. We'll bring you more details as we get them next here on Primetime, though. Confidential files revealing supposed secret dealings by Roman Abramovich during his reign at Chelsea Football Club have been revealed. I'll be finding where else the tentacles of oligarch power have infiltrated societies across the globe. Stay with us. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> that's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Brave us here, Tessa. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know. You're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> <film. laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you had? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going to. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Prime Time. Now, for decades, oligarchs have been growing in power and influence across the planet, from politics to property to the Premier League, of course, and to Putin ally and billionaire Roman Abramovich. The Russian took over the West London team in 2003, financially propelling them into the football stratosphere, winning 17 major trophies. The oligarch was revered by the Blue Army, the football team, pumping no less than £2 billion into the club. However, the party was going to be brought to an abrupt end when Russia, of course, invaded Ukraine. Ukraine. Abramovich's assets were frozen and he sold up and left. Chelsea has floundered since and the club now faces more misery as a fresh investigation into how the club's success was paid for has been opened. Leaked files just in the last 24 hours named the Cyprus Confidential Files, this is reporting by The Guardian, have revealed payments worth tens of millions were routed through offshore accounts linked to Abramovich and could have benefited the club, leaving them open to punishment. This is just one oligarch, of course, that we know of, but there are plenty others out there. We want to ask this evening how they impact our daily lives and how much power they really wield over politics, money, everything, really. Joining me now, we wanted to have this discussion whilst they're in London, entrepreneurship professor and author David Lingelbach, an oligarch researcher and author Valentina rodriguez Guerra. And, you know, you have put together a fascinating book about oligarchs' grip on power, and it goes back to essentially what an oligarch is in philosophical terms, David. Yes, that's right. Well, we tried to sort of update Aristotle a little bit in this book and to understand oligarchs as we see them today, as people who have both wealth and power and use one of those to acquire the other. So it's it's not different from Aristotle, but, um, you know, brings it into 2023. There's a difference between a business oligarch, as I understand it, Valentina, and a sort of political oligarch. How does that work? Well, a business oligarch is the one who uses the wealth that they have to gain power. Uh, in the meanwhile, a uh, political oligarch is the one who uses the power to gain the wealth. Like, it's the opposite. The opposite side of things. Now, here in the UK, there's often a lot of chatter about the ways that Russian oligarchs and uh, oligarchs in the former Soviet Union have been able to become part of our society. We've got even people in the House of Lords who have uh, come from that sort of uh, background. When you look at the UK and you look at links with oligarchy here, is there anything, well, what concerns you, David? Well, I mean, like many societies, the UK is sort of interpenetrated with oligarchs. Uh, I mean, we have this in the US, uh, Valentina has it in Colombia, and, and the UK has had a long tradition before the Russian oligarchs themselves. Uh, and dare I say it, the current prime minister of the UK could be considered an oligarch himself. He's certainly the richest prime minister in, in history. And uh, that wealth has been an important part of how he's gained power. Now, break that down for me. Does that necessarily mean it's bad oligarchy? No, it doesn't. Um, it, we in, certainly don't take a position on whether oligarchs are good or bad. I think, like most of us, oligarchs have features of darkness and light. And there's many examples of uh, otherwise bad oligarchs doing good things and, and the ver reverse. So uh, the Russian oligarchs are sort of a, a, sort of a subset, uh, an interesting subset, of course, uh, of, of the general phenomenon. Do you think, um, Valentina, you were saying that in Colombia there is a, a different circumstances through Central and Latin America, there's different types of oligarchs, some of whom are leaders in their own right now as well. Do you think there are societies in the world that are oligarch free? Mm, that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> it could be, but uh, I don't think so we, because people tend to uh, try to gain wealth or to gain power all, always. But could be, I don't know, David, what do you think? I mean, the Scandinavian societies uh, at today have relatively fewer uh, oligarchs than other societies do in contemporary uh, international economy. So, and Japan also relatively less so today. So there are a few examples, but pretty much in our data set, we see oligarchs everywhere in the world, on every continent, uh, if, if not in every country. 
Now, one of the more fascinating examples of a modern day tech oligarch, if we can call him that, is Elon Musk. And he's often been referred to as a sort of geopolitical agent of chaos mm. these days because of the uh, influence he has over things like telecommunications, satellites. You know, obviously, he's a private entrepreneur in his own right, but now also mass information as well. Um, have we seen anybody operate on this scale before? Um, I think so. I mean, we t there, there's three dimensions of power, and maybe the, the one that's the most important these days for oligarchs are what we call ideological oligarchs, the ones that change how we think and act. So before Musk, Musk came along and acquired Twitter or X, uh, you had people like Larry Page and Sergey Brin at Google. And if you think about how much those people have changed the ways in which we do things every day, they, they long predate uh, Musk. Of course, Twitter or X has really uh, become a much more influential and deliberately so mechanism. But I still don't think or we don't think that that's quite at the same level as uh, the Google folks would have. And of course, then there's AI. And, and that's sort of the coming phenomenon. I think we'll see many more oligarchs emerging uh, from the AI space. Now remind us of the title of the book, Valentina. Yeah, it's The Oligarch's Grape, Fusing Wealth and Power. It's been great having you both in the studio whilst you're visiting the UK. Valentina rodriguez Guerra and David Lingelbach. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Well, some more breaking news. We have more information on that crunch Labour vote in just the last hour. 56 Labour rebels on that SNP motion. And the Labour Party has just announced that any front bencher who defied the party's position is considered to have quit their role. That's 56. This means that any MP who voted for the SNP's motion for a ceasefire rather than Labour's motion for humanitarian pauses are no longer considered to be in the shadow cabinet. Extraordinary scenes this evening. I'll bring you more of those names of rebels when we have them. Well, next here on Primetime, I'm going to be joined here in the studio by our Primetime panel. We're going to go over some other headlines of the day, including the latest on tonight's political chaos in Westminster. Stay with us.
Welcome back. It's time now for our primetime panel to react to today's political news, and there's been a fair bit, hasn't there? Back with me is commentator Joanna Jarju and Telegraph columnist Ben Wright. And let's get back to that breaking news then from Parliament this evening. Labour's call for extended humanitarian pauses in Gaza was defeated by 290 votes to 183. Meanwhile, the SNP's amendment demanding a ceasefire was defeated by 293 votes to 125. Some 56 Labour MPs voted for the SNP amendment, serving shadow ministers among them, with the party saying they are now considered to have quit their jobs. Among them are Shadow Solicitor General Andy Slaughter and Shadow Domestic Abuse Minister Jess Phillips. Others include Sarah Owen, Rachel Hopkins and Paula Barker. Labour leader Keir Starmer has released a statement saying this, quote, I regret that some colleagues felt unable to support the position tonight, but I wanted to be clear about where I stood and where I will stand. Leadership is about doing the right thing. That is the least the public deserves and the least that leadership demands. I regret that some colleagues felt unable to support the position tonight, but I wanted to be clear about where I stood and where I will stand. Leadership is about doing the right thing. And that, as we just said there, this is a repeat of the top of the statement, is the least the public deserves. Those words there from Labour leader Keir Starmer. Now, both of you, we were just talking about this before in the commercial break. Um, quite large defeats on both of those no motions. Does any of that surprise you, Joanna? Um, I think the the number of um, Labour MPs who voted, um, you know, against Keir Starmer definitely surprised me a bit. But I think that it would be reassuring for a lot of Labour voters because I think that this is more of a principle issue for a lot of people. Um, I think when we've seen past conflicts, even when it's been things that we've been involved in, like, you know, the Iraq war, people haven't really had that vis visibility. And I think for even the MPs themselves, it's about their own conscience, but also about what the voters are um, pushing them to do. And I think that, you know, some of the um, MPs, probably when we look in more detail, you'll see that they'll be in certain constituencies mm. that will really push them to do this. And you can see that from, you know, the resignation of some councillors. And you can see just based on geography, in terms of the demographics, why they've had that pressure, why they've felt inclined to kind of go against that. But I think that, you know, going back to the principles, I think a, a big part of the Labour base has been about, I guess, um, the good of, you know, um, the majority and about mm. social justice and about what's, you know, best for, I guess, the people who um, aren't as powerful. And in this case, a lot of people see that as the Palestinian people. So it's almost as if, well, if we don't stand for this as the Labour Party, what do we stand for? And if you can't do this, then how will you react to other things when, you know, we're potentially the victim in other situations? And Ben, I wonder whether some viewers might be surprised at defeating the idea of a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire, because a lot of people in this country, have seen it on these marches, um, have taken up the cause of the Palestinian people, see the humanitarian risks that are unfolding. Um, but it's a complex issue when you bring it to the House of Commons, isn't it? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, the fact that the two motions were defeated is not a surprise because they were brought by Labour um, and by the SNP, and they don't have as many MPs. And and so obviously the Conservatives are able to defeat those motions. Um, and as, as you say, I mean, it was the, the size of the Labour rebellion on the SNP motion that really was the, the main surprise. And it's obviously it's an incredibly fraught issue and it's incredibly uncomfortable for Keir Starmer. I do wonder, though, whether, whether he might actually come out of this looking stronger because, um, as, as uh, Dan Bloom said when, he, when you were talking to him her, earlier, the Labour motion was the more nuanced no motion. The SNP one was pretty straightforward. Um, and, and this is a really, really complicated issue. And Starmer has taken the more nuanced approach. And ultimately, he's trying to prove that he is prime ministerial and he will be able to deal with nuanced issues. In that statement, Joanna, it's all about Keir Starmer sort of talking about his leadership and needing to stand yeah. firm as a leader. I mean... It certainly seems to be what he's angling at. Yes, but I think that um, the problem uh, that Keir Starmer's got at the moment is that he didn't use that nuanced approach to begin with. And I think that obviously that um, clip from LBC when he was asked, you know, whether um, Israel should withhold um, water to the Palestinians, that basically set him off in a really bad light to begin with. And I think that that's what people remember. And even though he's being nuanced now, and even though, you know, Label tabled their own kind of more middle ground motion, 
it just people have already kind of started with the mindset that it's either ceasefire or nothing and now that you're trying to get them to kind of climb down from that when they've been on these marches they're already angry you know and um, tensions are higher and i just think that people don't really care whether he's going for the middle ground anymore because he's already annoyed them he's annoyed the muslim community when he went you know on that visit so people are basically saying you either do this or you know we're against you in in some instances but i do understand that there's also other um, you know, areas of the mm. electorate that he might also gain some fans from this. Mm. So it just kind of boils down to which size is bigger in the end and how much of a loss he ends up having overall. Yeah, and Ben, look, uh, a sizable rebellion, some yeah. 56 names that we have so far. Uh, what will that look like in terms of the party and reshuffling? Yeah, well, it's going to be very, very tricky. I mean, I think one thing he's been helped with is Jeremy Corbyn and mm. being interviewed by Piers Morgan mm. the other day. And that will remind people of what the Labour position was under Jeremy Corbyn, what it was like in the bad old days. And obviously, Keir Starmer is trying to transform Labour from those days. Um, and this is another step on that journey. Mm. Uh, and having Corbyn unable to answer those questions about Hamas when uh, Piers Morgan put them, put them to him, 15, 16 times, mm. would remind people what it was like. Yeah, I think you got the point there about putting as much clear blue water in the Labour Party between that previous sort of Corbyn idea and what Starmer is clearly trying to do now. So, uh, you know, fascinating scenes this evening in the comments. Joanna and Ben, we really appreciate your views. And Piers Morgan, the man himself, is standing up there. Look, the Corbyn effect is still rippling. I'm trying to think of a question I can ask you 15 times that you wouldn't answer. Oh, there's a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a big show tonight. We'll be doing a lot on this uh, Rwanda fiasco. I said it would never work. It's never going to work. And it's just a question of how much more pain the Tories want to cause themselves. And we've got Owen Jones making his debut on Piers Morgan Uncensored. That won't be a calm interview. No, See what I mean he has to say when I ask him the Corbyn questions. I never thought I'd see the day Owen Jones here in the Talk TV studio. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. Can't wait for that, Piers. And that is all we've got time for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. As you saw there, Piers Morgan Uncensored, up next. Good night. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republic of Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republic of Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9pm, right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah. Me and you, conquer time. Who Back wins? Us. You. Do you know what I love about Talk today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I am Sanz. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. there's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to...